right, hi everyone, welcome. I'm so excited to be here to moderate our faculty panel today. Um, my name is Alex Schroeder, I'm the Associate Director of Academic Initiatives at the Columbia Climate School, and I'm also an alumni of the SUMA program. So I'm going to start off by introducing my esteemed colleagues on the panel today. So first we have Dr. Braddock Lindsay, who currently serves as the co-director of the Master of Science in Sustainability Science program. He is also a Lamont Research Professor in the Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory. He serves as the director of the Lamont Doherty, Dor Lamont Doherty Stable Isotope Laboratory. And his research includes, includes utilizing the geochemistry of corals, microfossils, and marine sediments to document past oceanographic and climate conditions over a range of timescales. Next, we have Dr. Stephen Cohen. Dr. Cohen is the Senior Vice Dean of the School of Professional Studies and is also a professor in the practice of public affairs at the School of International and Public Affairs. He is the director of the MPA in Environmental Science and Policy Program at SEPA, the director of the MS in Sustainability Management Program, and also the director of the Earth Institute's Research Program on Sustainability Policy and Management. In addition, Dr. Cohen served as the executive director of the Earth Institute from 2006 to 2018. Next, we have Rochelle McCadney. Rochelle is an environmental and social risk management professional with global experience in the energy and extractive industries. She is currently the vice president with Citigroup in environmental and social risk management and serves as an adjunct associate professor for the workshop in applied earth systems management within the MPA and Environmental and Science, Pro Science and Policy Program. She's also an alumna of the MPA and Environmental and Science Policy Program at SIPA. Next, we have Dr. Ming Feng Ting. Dr. Ting currently serves as the Lamont Research Professor in the Ocean and Climate Physics. She is an adjunct professor of Earth and Environmental Sciences and also a co-senior director for education at the Columbia Climate School. Dr. Ting also serves as the co-director for the MA in Climate and Society program. Her research spans a broad range of topics in climate sciences, including Asian monsoon variability in climate and change, droughts and heat wave mechanisms, the Atlantic multidecadal variability and impact, polar lower latitude interactions, and tropical cyclones. And last but not least, we have Sean Hoyt. Sean Hoyt is a sustainability professional focused on addressing climate-related risks and identifying the impacts and opportunities they create for our communities. Sean currently serves as the head of Clean Energy Networks at Con Edison, where he provides strategic oversight and leadership geared toward the cultivation of cross-sector industry partnerships to advance an equitable, clean energy economy. Sean also currently serves as a lecturer in the Integrative Capstone Workshop within the MS and Sustainability Management Program. And he is also an alumni of the Sustainability Management Program. So we are going to start off, we have a few questions that we'll ask each of our panelists, and then we will end with Q&A from the audience. So my first question, and I'm gonna go in order here, my first question is how does your research and practice inform the courses that you teach. So go ahead, Dr. Lindsay. Hi, thanks for coming today. As I heard the early introduction, the, the, most of our faculty in our program actually are Lamont research professors, or they're affiliated with Lamont, so we, we directly bring the research that they're doing, cutting edge research, into the classroom, we're talking about real world current, current problems, and we try to talk about the scientific aspects of those problems and the potential solutions and we try to train students to, uh, we think be the scientists in the room when these important sustainability decisions are being made great um go ahead steve do you want the whole story <laughs> condensed <laughs> well when i was a little no uh, <laughs> well i i guess um So the environmental science and policy, environmental science and policy program started in 2002, um, and the sustainability management program was 2010, and they both reflected sort of different impulses and, and parts of my own background. So I was in the EPA in the late 70s and early 80s, working in water and waste management and toxic waste, underground storage tanks. The first thing that I noticed is that the government was really bad at managing itself. So my first work 
was something called the effective public manager. And I wrote about contract management and quality management in government, and then moved on to uh, strategic planning for regulation. How do we develop ways of influencing the behavior of polluters, uh, not just using command and control regulation, but a whole range of techniques. So I worked on applying strategy to environmental regulation, all of which led uh, to the thought process that most decision makers in government um, didn't know any environmental science but were making environmental decisions. And so how do we create a policy program where students at least had an introduction to environmental science? And I'd worked with uh, many Lamont scientists to develop a curriculum for the environmental science and policy program. This is an intense year-long program uh, that requires full-time study for 12 months or 11 months and an intensive summer of environmental science. It's a great program, it's 20 years old, and it is a proven track record of success. Uh, but the key difference between this and a regular public policy program is first an emphasis on management, because everything I do has that, but also we brought in environmental science. So our students graduate with a knowledge of environmental science and how it applies to environmental policy. But one of the problems with the program is it was too intense for everybody. I wanted a program also that could attract working professionals and at the same time the field of management seemed to me to also need to reflect sustainability issues. So I wrote a book called, uh, first I wrote a book called Understanding Environmental Policy which influenced the, the ESP program but then I wrote a book called Sustainability Management which was to try to frame the field of sustainability management and create the curriculum for that. So we integrate into a management program what we call the physical dimensions of sustainability. And this is environmental science, but it's also the built environment, it's also energy efficiency, it's a whole range of issues broader than uh, simply uh, environment itself, but the whole range of issues on uh, environmental sustainability. And then the field of sustainability management itself has been evolving. So when we started, we're doing what I now call the subfield of environmental sustainability. But what's happened is it's evolved. It now includes diversity, equity, inclusion, and access. It includes corporate governance. It includes community impact. And so our curriculum has expanded to include all of those subjects. If you had told me in 2010, when we started the program, that I'd have a, three courses on sustainability fas in fashion, I would have told you you were nuts. <laughs> but here we are. We have three courses. that We have four courses on a diversity, equity, and inclusion, and on social justice and environment. All of our management courses now include treatment of that. So I guess what I'm saying is the practice in the field, my own research, the research of my colleagues in our sustainability policy and management team, has all gone right into the classroom. And so our curriculum is cutting edge. Uh, we're way ahead of anybody else. We also, uh, in both of our programs, the both two programs I direct together have a couple thousand graduates, so we really have an unsurpassed alumni network. Uh, you, can't, you can't really work in this field without tripping over our alums. There's two of them <laughs> on the panel here. So I guess I'll leave. That's the short version. Yeah, yeah, that was great. <laughs> uh, Rochelle, go ahead. Everything that Dr. Cohen um, just said, in fact, hearing it in retrospect just reminds me of how privileged I was to have that early exposure. I'm a, I don't know, can everyone hear me? Okay, okay. I'm a 2009 graduate of the MPA ESP program, and as Dr. Cohen just mentioned, that was kind of you know, the seventh, uh, seventh cohort for the MPA ESP program, and right before the SUMA program had started, um, it was started the program before the Obama administration started and, you know, had an eye towards going to work in a policy space, actually before he was even elected, so it was a very exciting time on campus as I reflect. Um, and I actually did not see that my career path would necessarily lead to finance, just a, a little bit more color about me and what I bring to the classroom. Um, I went to work for the U.S. Congress. I was very excited about the potential passage of climate-related legis legislation, and when it stalled in the Senate, I thought it might be best for me to um, find other avenues. Um, so I went to Texas. I, mean, I thought there was a lot of work that needed to be done there, um, specifically for an oil company you may have heard of that had a very large spill in the Gulf. <laughs> um, that was a tremendous learning opportunity, and it really 
um, brought to life a lot of the super fun lessons that uh, Dr. Cohen conveyed to us in the classroom. Um, and I'd say basically I became a, um, I don't want to say a, a master of all trades, <laughs> jack of all trades, or Jane of all trades, uh, master of none, but I learned how to deploy um, you know, different types of skill sets that I developed on campus, primarily around science communication, um, quickly distilling um, it, you know, insights from a range of sources, and um, you know, also just navigating a very evolving space, both on the uh, policy side and in the private sector. Um, following my time in Texas, um, I came back to New York, where, as was mentioned in my intro, um, focused on um, environmental and social risk management as it relates to project financing and increasingly debt capital markets. Um, my specific course and, and what I bring to the classroom in the capstone environment is advising students on their um, communication as it relates to um, the interpretation of policy um, and sort of bringing that um, experience that I had uh, with the vagaries of the policy process as well as um, the time-bound challenges and limited information um, that you know is available to us as professionals in order to craft um, recommendations for implementation at the agency level. Um, it's a tremendous privilege of mine to return to campus this semester. Um, feels like a real full circle moment and I certainly remember when I was sitting in seats um, like you all, attending the um, All Ivy um, Student Fair to understand the range of environmental um, career fields that um, might be a possibility. I think um, at the time, uh, yeah, carbon trading was, was very, very much in vogue, and we've kind of seen um, where those changes have emerged. Um, but I will just in, in closing to say, you know, certainly um, be agile and um, adaptable and paying attention to all of the um, changes, but should you decide to um, come to Columbia and um, particularly choose the program that I'm an alumna of, um, be prepared for a very exciting ride, um, lots of exposure, and you never know what doors it'll open in future. Great. Sorry. Go ahead, Ming Ping. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, so it's very exciting to see everyone here uh, today. And uh, I, uh, I'm uh, co-directing this program called Climate and Society. And the program uh, developed actually uh, about now about 20 years ago. Uh, basically, the, I, the original motivation is to, climate, uh, to communicate climate science to users, user community. And uh, uh, it started with the IRI, you know, International Research Institute for Climate and Society, where uh, the aim of that institute is to uh, perform research and climate service and directly interact with people who really need that information, particularly the global south, the developing countries. Uh, so the idea of training people who can actually help us do that, you know, um, students, younger generation, to be able to be the communicators of climate information and, and perform climate service to the user community is really the, the ultimate goal of the uh, program. Of course, over the 20 years, the program has grown a lot. Uh, so we now have um, uh, focuses on you know, climate adaptation, climate change impacts, you know, a lot of the climate-related risk, you know, cli climate crisis is really at the center of the program now. Uh, but communication, communicating climate information is still the ultimate goal. So in terms of this question, uh, all our faculties are, you know, as I said, from the climate, uh, the International Inst uh, Research Institute, it's a mouthful, <laughs> IRI, um, and uh, they are practitioners in the field. They are constantly traveling to all over the world, uh, working with uh, uh, communities uh, and trying to solve the problem, you know, uh, poverty, uh, droughts, you know, whatever climate disaster that's hitting, and they are there to help solving those problems. So they are in the classroom uh, with the students. So it's really a, a, a very um, deep kind of experience for students to be able to experience that kind of uh, teaching. And uh, myself, I'm a uh, climate scientist, as Alex mentioned. I do a variety of uh, research uh, in terms of bringing into the classroom uh, clearly, and you know, I, I teach this course called quantitative uh, modeling of climate sensitive systems and uh, where we basically in involve a lot of the statistical quantitative analysis methods used in uh, digesting and interpreting climate information, climate data. And that is needed you know, throughout my, my, my research all the time. 
And uh, um, so we uh, bring in, as researchers, as practitioners, we bring into the classroom the kind of experience we also do in our daily life in the sense that we encourage students to work together in group projects uh, and in you know, open book exams, because I believe you know, research is done in the open environment. You don't need to memorize anything. So we, we encourage that kind of thinking, understanding, uh, interpretation. Uh, so uh, a lot of uh, group projects, as I said, and final projects encourage students to work as a group, because we, again, researchers work collaboratively all the time. So I think it's, you know, in, in closing, uh, we, uh, as researchers, as, as practitioners, getting into the classroom is what uh, uh, puts all the programs here as unique, as you, know, you heard from uh, Rochelle and, and Sean. They're all uh, actually working uh, professionals. So we also, in our program, we also have working professionals as well as, uh, as researchers uh, teaching in the program. So it's, it's a uh, you know, huge learning opportunity for everyone here. I really uh, hope I'll see some of you. Uh, in next year's class. Great. Thanks so much. Go ahead, Sean. Yeah, good morning, everyone, and welcome. Um, when I think back of my journey through the sustainability management program to where I am today, I, I think about what kind of drew me to the program. And part of that is what we're celebrating this week, whether it's a celebration or reflection, but tomorrow mix, makes the 10-year anniversary of Hurricane Sandy. And during that time, you know, New York was really ravaged. We saw a once-in-a-lifetime or in a generation storm that really kind of wreaked havoc all across the city. Now, the company that I work for is Con Edison, as Alex mentioned. It's the electric, steam, and gas utility that serves the 10 million people that live here in New York City and Westchester County. And, and we were devastated. Uh, a lot of our equipment was damaged. We lost power. People died, unfortunately. And I never doubted that the work that I was doing was important. Right? My job at the time, I was an electrician. And Part of my role was to when people were, when people would stay home during storms, I was driving into the storm, right? sort of like first responders. And in the Lower East Side of Manhattan, we have a steam generating plant that took on a lot of water and flooding. And again, transformers blew up, power was lost, um, people were felt stranded, right, including some of my colleagues. Uh, I was responsible for going back into that same facility, um, removing the transformer that had been destroyed and putting a new one in, in a certain amount of time so that we could restore power to our customers. At the same time, I, I had other situations happen that really made me question how I could have a larger impact and, and really help this transition that was direly needed. Um, so I found a sustainability management program. Um, Rochelle, I, I know it wasn't available when, when you were looking, but... Um, I found the program, and, I, and at the time, Dr. Cohen said, you know, it may not be obvious to you today, but within the next decade, you'll see so many careers in this space, um, where now we see chief sustainability officers at large Fortune 100 companies, right? This was an afterthought back when Dr. Cohen was creating these courses and these programs. Um, fast forward, you know, as, as an electrician, I, I had to learn the fundamentals of how to manage, or how to be in management, so that I could take my next steps to the current role that I'm in today, where I'm leading organizations and really implementing projects to mitigate those climate-related risks such as Hurricane Sandy. Um, how I apply these practices to my course setting is I, I teach the Cap Integrative Capstone Workshop, which is designed to simulate a real-world exper experience for students. Um, Dr. Ting mentioned working in groups. It's the biggest group project that you'll ever have. You're essentially consultants for a real life client and you're really solving a real world problem for them. Um, in my role, um, now I kind of understand I'm the client. So I apply some of the practice, the, the thinking to my students so that they could be successful in this space as well as leadership, um, messaging and leadership sort of qualities that I have learned along the way so that they could be successful. Actually, the midterm briefings going to be this, this Tuesday coming up, so please wish them luck. Uh, <laughs> the, the, our client is Trinity Church Wall Street. They're looking for a climate and DEI-related strategies, and I've been able to connect my students with a lot of industry personnel to interview so that they could learn, so that they could really give this client the best outcome that is manageable. So looking forward to talking to you, and hopefully we will see you on campus soon. Great. Thank you all so much. Uh, we're going to move on to our next question here. 
So all of the programs that you're seeing here today offer you know, unparalleled access to faculty and academic and professional opportunities. So I want, I'd like to hear from each of you on what kind of interactions do you have with your students or another way to frame it, what opportunities do, our, do these students, prospective students have coming in um, in each of these programs? I want to um, correct something also that I heard earlier when I was coming in and that our, has to do with our program and how it relates to SUMA. So, so our students, most of them have a STEM background, but not all of them. We have some students that are from the finance business industry and have the quantitative skills. So we're, in that case, we're training them to in the sciences, but they have the quantitative skills. And this also relates to, to your question, and that is, um, what is what's kind of unique about our program um, we have, you know, these uh, access to the Lamont Doherty campus, and we have um, roughly three quarters of our faculty teach or, or work at Lamont. And there's a, it, even though it's not in the city, it's a half hour north of the city. There's a bus that goes back and forth every hour. So we, um, there's a lot of um, students going back and forth. There's a lot of faculty that live in the city, like myself, that tr commute up there every day. Um, though we teach the classes in the city, there's a lot of access to Lamont. Um, n a number of our classes get students up there on weekends. I know um, Brendan Buckley, our co-director, takes students out into the forests on weekends up there. Other faculty, um, we have capstone projects in the city, um, monitoring, one of them was monitoring air quality on subway cars, <laughs> which was a really interesting project. Um, <laughs> And so there's a lot of, uh, and this, all these projects change from semester to semester, depending on um, um, at what's going on at Lamont, what's funded, um, who needs help in the lab. And so we try to get our students, uh, if they, and the other thing I want to say is our student body is very, very diverse. We have a range of people from biology to engineering to finance to people like myself that are geochemists. Um, and, and so we work with this broad array of, of students to try to individually um, help them design their their path forward in a sense to, you know, to let them design their own own curriculum which is why we have a lot of uh, classes that are optional we have only three required classes um, I know it was two the third one is a, a statistics and data analysis class um, but everything else is optional and we have a lot of the students in our program are, are in other programs that are um, in SUMA and other programs in the campus so there's a lot of inter interrelation between these programs. Steve. I'll pass. So um, we have a lot of different kind of faculty. We have a lot of different kind of students in the two programs that I direct. Uh, so let me talk about the different kind of faculty first. As you just heard, we have Lamont research professors. Now you may not know what the Lamont Dirty Earth Observatory is or the IRI. Uh, International Research Institute on Climate and Society. Also up at the Lamont campus, we have the Center for Earth Information Systems Network, which is a largely NASA-funded operation that takes satellite data and turns it into material that farmers and business people around the world can use in decision-making. Uh, the Lamont campus houses the top environmental scientists in the world. It is a powerhouse. Um, many discoveries on environmental science and climate science came from that campus. It's a wonderful community. When I ran the Earth Institute, it was really uh, a great pleasure to get up there all the time and see that in action. So you have full-time scientists that we somehow bamboozled into coming downtown to teach uh, our <laughs> students. Uh, because they go up there because they don't really, you know, they could all be senior faculty at other places, but they want to focus on research. We told them and we talked them into the idea that they have to engage with students because they're all committed to saving the planet. Or many of them are, actually most of them are. So they come downtown and do that. And for many of them, uh, it's a labor of love. I mean, you don't, uh, it's, it's not really central to their professional ambition. So they engage with students uh, out of a love for doing that. Then we have people like you see here, some of our graduates who are practitioners in the field doing this work, directly translating that work uh, into the classroom. And then the third type of faculty are people like me who, uh, who are academics, you know. I mean, 
I'm a very practice-oriented academic, but you know, I've been working at Columbia University for four decades, so I have to confess <laughs> I'm an academic. Uh, we have other academics. And so they, they engage with students uh, in the way that you're, you probably are familiar with, with your traditional faculty-student interaction. But one of the things that's characteristic of our programs, and you heard about it for Climate Society, it's the case in all the programs, is that, first of all, they're cooperative and not competitive. Uh, what I say at orientation is look around you. If we're successful, everybody here will be here at graduation. We're not trying to eliminate people. Uh, that's where the group work comes in. People help each other because we, to solve these problems, you need every discipline. You need law, you need policy, you need economics, you need environmental science, you need engineering, management. They all have to work together. And so we're creating the people that are those translators. All of these programs do that. So they are the people who, you know, perhaps a little bit more scientific, in, in my case, in MPA, a little more policy or management, in climate and society, uh, focused on the climate issue specifically. Uh, the other programs uh, tend to look at a broader range of environmental sustainability. So the student culture is cooperative, collegial, and helping each other. Mm -hmm. Because when you get into the field, nobody has a monopoly of knowledge of this field. You need each other desperately. And so we build a culture around that. And it's built, first of all, on these Lamont scientists who have decided that they couldn't just contain their knowledge to the research world. The IRI was started by a guy named Mark Kane, as was the Climate Society program. Mark was the f and his colleagues developed the first mathematical model to predict the El Nino effect. And Mark was frustrated because nobody was using <coughs> what he had discovered. So he created this master's program specifically to create professionals who could then apply climate knowledge in the actual real world. So the IRI has these scientists and this service unit uh, that creates new science and modeling, but then brings it out into the world. So all of the pr these programs are built on the same philosophy, and the idea of working together with students in a community effort is really at the heart of what we do, and you'll see that in every one of the programs that the Climate School launches. Okay. Michelle. Thanks, Dr. Cohen. Um, yeah, I, uh, you know, again, echo all of the sentiments and, um, you know, are a tremendous beneficiary of the interdisciplinary nature of um, the MPA ESP program. Um, I will say that um, throughout my career and certainly during my um, one year program, um, you know, leaned heavily on um, both my uh, professors in the classroom, but also the broader ecosystem of. Um, webinars, um, presentations, opportunities to visit the Lamont Doherty Observatory. Um, I've been on the Earth Institute mailing list since 2009 and <laughs> have benefited um, just from the research discussed and access to um, a range of academics and practitioners that have a, you know, a deep bench of experience that I continue to benefit from. I think at this stage, um, I really encourage the students in my classroom to take advantage of um, the full Columbia universe, it's Columbia in the city of New York, um, as they are looking at um, potential capstone groups that they would like to join. I mean, our ESP program is very unique in that um, there's that continuity of our cohort and students have two semesters with one topic where you have the policy and the science lens. Um, but through their elective courses, um, when I was a student, I certainly benefited from an elective at the law school, at the Foundation School of Engineering, um, and also um, at the um, Graduate School of Architecture, Planning, and Preservation um, relating to the built environment. So um, in keeping with that vein, I certainly encourage um, prospective students and certainly students enrolled in the program that are in my workshop to take full advantage of the range of resources available to them and try to encourage them not to get overwhelmed because there are seriously a lot of cool things going on and any opportunity to kind of um, uh, you know interrogate and, and interact with complex topics that you may have only read just read about um, you know certainly be instructive um, as they move forward through their um, academic studies and into their careers yeah so um, I think a lot of the uh, things touched upon all apply uh, to uh, what I'm going to say. 
uh, in terms of sort of you know researchers and practitioners in the classroom, and uh, that kind of firsthand experience working with uh, professional uh, uh, you know researchers and, and and practitioners in the in the you know very direct sense. Um, and we uh, have a lot, of, we the, the order courses uh, design a lot of the uh, group projects, which is aimed to mimic basically real world situation. For example, in our basic dynamic, dynamics of climate class, we, uh, our faculty design um, projects like in, uh, asking students to communicate uh, the basic uh, physical, si physical si science of climate to people who have no idea uh, what climate science is about. Right, so the basic communication skills, so projects like that, and uh, we also design uh, projects linking data and uh, um, you know justice issues. So they, they look for work with community, you know, reach out to community, and um, you know, co-production sense not not so much of in terms of research, but understanding uh, the problem based on quantitative analysis. So these kind of classroom research experiences are already very rich in the program. Uh, in addition, we also have uh, GRA, uh, Graduate Research Assistantship, every year. So for those students who are really interested in, involved in research, they can apply to those positions. It's part of the uh, uh, assistantship as well, you know, it's paid uh, position. And uh, the most important part is, of course, you get to work with the top scientists in the field, experts in the field. Um, and then we also have uh, summer internship. Uh, which is required a part of the course. So every student have to do either a summer internship uh, working with a real organization outside, uh, or they can do work on a capstone, like you know, you've know you heard in the uh, sustainable management course, uh, uh, and another program al already talked about the capstone. So we also have capstone workshops in the summer involve uh, students in solving real world problem. And they are all supervised by uh, working professionals, again, uh, researchers uh, in the field. I myself, you know, have served as GRA uh, advisors for many of our students, so they get to see how I do my research um, uh, in, in real action. So, uh, lots and lots of opportunities. Thanks. Go ahead, Sean. Yep, I um, fully agree with what my fellow pan panelists have already conveyed, and I would just add that um, as a student, I, I really got involved in volunteering. Um, we have a, a number of student groups. The, the one for sustainability management is called SUMASA. That's the Sustainability Management Student Association. And I led that, that group for some time. And what it really did was give me exposure to a lot of different parts of the industry. Um, that being said, working at Kinetison, I also connected my fellow classmates to industry, um, taking them on tours of the power plants or within our different facilities that they could learn about some of the large technologies and things that we were reading up on and, and researching. And, and, and I brought that same sort of atmosphere to, to my classroom today. So we have one of two mandatory courses, which one is mine, the, the, the capstone, which you take at the end of your, your journey through the program curriculum. And then the intro to sustainability management that Dr. Cohen teaches um, alongside other key um, professors. And one of my goals for the for the my students which are 13 this semester is usually 15 students or less so they could have a closer relationship with the adjunct faculty whereas in a larger course that may have 50 plus it may be harder um, but I've been able to connect my, my current students to, to industry and to volunteer opportunities um, I, I also sit on the board for the Columbia Alumni Association um, which is the governing sort of volunteer body for all schools at Columbia University, where I have invited some of my, my students to some of our events, where one of them is now on the board as a student representative for the Alumni Association. Right, so the opportunities are always going to be there. You just have to be willing, able to take advantage of them. I think Rochelle mentioned perfectly that you could get overwhelmed. There are a lot of emails. There are a lot of different events going on. But as long as you manage and prioritize, I think that if you take advantage of them, you'll hit the ground running. Um, I've also been able to connect my students to, to work opportunities when they graduate. You should really start looking, I think, from day one. I, I wouldn't say put too much time and effort into it when you start your, your, your coursework. But it's something that you should be thinking about the entire time as a student because the last thing you want to do is wait till the end and then you're completely overwhelmed trying to find 
employment opportunities. A lot of the relationships that you build with your fellow classmates will open doors to employment opportunities as well. Uh, I always tell my, uh, my students that you know, a group project that goes wrong may come to bite you <laughs> in the professional world later. So just be mindful of that. And um, again, it, there's no better place in New York City to, to be connected to industry. Great, thank you all so much. So I think we touched on this a little bit, but I do want to give everyone here an opportunity to add if, um, if you feel the need to. Uh, is there anything that you would like to highlight that makes um, your program or programs um, really special? Um, if there's anything you want to add, go ahead, um, or we can move to our next question, but I wanted to give you the opportunity. I think something that's special um, to me in our program is the fact that we have very small classes. Our, our average class size is around 10 students. The largest class is our carbon capture class, which only has 25 students in it. Um, so the classes are small, and there's a mixture of students from different programs in the classes. So students work um, in groups, and in many of our classes, we focus on you know, group projects and also you know, public, publicly discussing some of these complex scientific issues. So there's a lot of work on public speaking and writing skills. Which is something I strongly believe in. We have, um, and we also just some of these issues um, that we, we, I think we cover most of the significant sustainability issues facing society um, today. And some of these issues are pretty controversial. So we actually have, we do have a class in how to manage um, discussing diverse stakeholder interests in a, in, on some of these complex um, issues where there's a lot of different people um, with different views of what's going on and what. Also, it does involve you know, disinformation, all that aspects of that. So, I, to me, that's what's pretty special about our program is that we have this you know, really intimate um, discussions in the classroom and outside the classroom about a lot of these really complicated issues that are we're all facing in the near term. Great. Does anyone else want to add? Yeah. I guess what I'd say is special is our students are mission driven. They come to these programs. Sure, they want to get ahead. They want to be. They want to make. Uh, they want to make a living. Everybody needs to do that, but they also want to save the planet, and and they all come for that reason. Um, they could go to a business school. They could go to a law school. They could go to any. Our students are incredibly talented. They could always go to those kinds of places, um, but instead they come here because they want this experience and exposure to the faculty, but also to each other. And what's really special is that sense of spirit and mission um, that uh, I certainly try to reinforce, our faculty reinforces, but it's just there. And it's just, uh, you know, you can't escape it. Uh, and it's a really kind of warm feeling, frankly, when you know everybody around you is there for pretty much the same reason. Thank you. Yeah. Michelle, if you want to add anything. Um, oh, yeah, I'll just quickly add that, um, I don't know why I feel so inclined to being close to the microphone, but um, I do think that the summer of the MPAESP program is really special. I know that Dr. Cohen has already mentioned, and also Alfred, that we get a broad base of science, but um, I think that it's really valuable in an academic context as opposed to having the stressors of the workplace and sort of just you know, dense reports, or maybe if you're less, if you don't routinely read IPCC reports, but you certainly understand the urgency of the climate crisis. Um, having a climatology class and access to, um, you know, leading professors um, that will help you understand how models were generated and kind of walk you through their process, as well as um, I gravitated more to the environmental chemistry and toxicology courses, and that kind of dictated where I started my career, but even now, 13 years later, um, you know, I remember um, the lab exercises and particularly um, some of the challenges that my lab group faced. So I, I certainly echo Sean's point in terms of the importance of, um, you know, showing up and being there and being a good team player in the academic setting. It makes um, when you're in the workplace and making critical decisions with, again, very um, limited data or, you know, maybe just proprietary information. Um, well equipped to discern um, what is credible and what and what isn't. So um, I think it's amazing that so many of you have a wealth of programs to choose from where you have an opportunity to engage with these topics in real time in the classroom where while the risks are still high, um, but where your um, mission driven nature and idealism can lead you to solutions that some of us in the workforce are a little more um, constrained. 
um, unfortunately, not, not specifically mentioning any of my workplaces, but just noting um, you know, other competing factors to consider. Um, and with that said, um, for those uh, you know, students that um, are able to speak to me, I certainly um, you know, encourage them to continue to, to really maximize on the exploration and that will make the, uh, the path forward um, you know, that much um, simpler in some instances. Great. Yeah. Oh, you saw <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, so, yeah, I wanted to, I mean, we already talked a lot about this, uh, the, you know, uh, features of the program that really we, we, we feel is really unique and, and a uh, great experience for students. Uh, one, one other thing I wanted to highlight uh, for our, particularly our program, I mean, applied to probably all the programs here, uh, is the interdisciplinarity of the program, climate society, uh, obviously, can, from the name, you know, climate science combined with uh, societal uh, impacts, but bringing this, the two together is like how we created the program in the very beginning, and uh, uh, it becomes clear now, yeah, that these are so tightly connected, you know, climate science, cl cl climate impacts, pretty much impacts every corner of the world. Uh, you can't imagine anything that's not impacted by climate uh, now. So um, we uh, really need uh, so, sort of like you know, different background students working together. So that is one of our strongest strengths from the very beginning, but even more, more so now, uh, that our students come from all different backgrounds. You can, you name it, you know, anything you, you can think of, you know, even people in the arts, you know, dancers, um, you know, artists, um, uh, visual artists, um, uh, musicians, uh, comedian, you know, we have all in our program. So, uh, you know, it really is so diverse uh, that we feel as faculty member, you know, we, we learn so much from our students because they bring in so many different perspectives into the program and through working together, as we've talked a lot about group projects, you know, that is obviously the, the big feature of all the programs here. And through work together, you, you learn from each other as well because you all bring in different perspectives, different expertise into the, uh, the classroom. Uh, into the projects you work on, work on. and so uh, not only you are learning from the you know, world-leading scientists, uh, researchers, practitioners in the program, but you also learn from each other. I think that is, uh, you know, a feature that we can't emphasize more. Uh, it's so so uh, important. Even though you know students sometimes come to us like say, "Oh, I, I don't have any quantitative background. You know, I don't feel like I belong." We always tell them, "No, you you absolutely belong." Because you, what you lack, we'll give to you, but you, you, what you bring into the program is what we really cherish. So. Thank you. Um, you know, the, the thing about answering questions last is that if my fellow panelists leave me little to say, right? Uh, Alex, I'm not suggesting I go first next. Right? That's <laughs> okay, not noted. what this is about. Um, no, but if I could add anything, it's the flexibility. Um, I was working full time, still am, at Con Edison, and the way that the course and the program was designed was for part-time students, right, like me. Um, the classes were at night or in the evening, so I was able to go after work from 6 to 8 p.m., um, taking two courses a semester, right, so I got the most out of my experience. Um, oftentimes, I say that um, the part-time path is the best path because I get to meet so many more brilliant and bright people along my journey. Um, obviously, there's trade-offs if you, you know, if you have to be full-time. Um, or if you're looking for a job immediately, it's probably best that you go full time. But I would say the flexibility and then the evolution, the program's continuing to evolve. You heard Dr. Cohen talk about there being multiple fashion courses and diversity, equity, and inclusion. Those didn't exist when I was a student. So I'm very happy to come back now as a, a faculty member and see the evolution of the program. And as well as the opportunity to take courses in any school at Columbia, as long as it fits within the curriculum. So oftentimes we had students go off to the business school to take a course or to the law school or to SEPA. Um, it, it's just the flexibility is, is, is unparalleled, in my opinion. Great. Well, thank you all so much. That was wonderful and enlightening. And I'd like to open it up for questions. Um, I would just ask that you direct your question to um, a panelist or a couple panelists. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> change and, well, thank you. Hello. Uh, climate change and environment are global issues. And unfortunately, nature doesn't know about political divisions. <laughs> so I want to know about all the programs 
what is the global view that the programs have. Because for public sector, for example, US public sector is very different from the public sector around the world, especially if you want to work on environmental issues. Uh, also in science, how uh, for the masters in science, how is this research uh, helping wherever it's done, uh, especially if it's down in the global south, how is helping change the actual situation toward more resilience or more adaptations or so on. And for the master in arts, uh, climate is also an issue of justice. So how is justice being addressed on this, uh, on, on, on this program? Uh, especially uh, global justice. Thank you. I, I want to start with uh, Rene Dubois said that we should think globally and act locally. Um, and it's true that uh, the planet uh, doesn't, and the ecosystems, the biosphere doesn't recognize national sovereignty, but that's how the world operates. So all of these programs have to deal with the complex relationships between uh, governments, the private sector, and the planet, and also the fact that uh, different parts of the world are developing at different rates. And so uh, this is the, it's a very complicated issue. I'm a political scientist, so this is actually my home discipline trying to figure these things out. I can tell you that uh, it's a struggle, but th the way that I always put it for problem solving is that uh, we actually in the public sector never solve problems. We make them less bad. The public policy is remedial, serial, partial, and incremental, moving away from the problem. So, you know, uh, for example, here in New York City, in the 1990s, we had over 2,000 homicides a year. Despite some crime spikes, we're still well below 500 a year today. So that makes it less bad, unless you're one of the 400 or so people that got killed last year. And so that's the nature of the world we're in. We're not going to make it perfect. We're going to make it better. Uh, I hope that uh, through the efforts of the people on the panel and the students who are going to be coming to our program, our programs, that you will make it better. I and mean, that's what I'm putting my faith in. My faith is in uh, the idealism and the skills of the people who are interested in what we're doing. And I have to say that having worked in this for most of the last 40 years, uh, things are better in many respects than they were before. These issues were fringe issues when I started working on them. Nobody paid attention. Now they're at the center of global discussion. And so I have a great deal of faith in human ingenuity and uh, in the fact that we're going to solve these problems, uh, or at least make them less bad. Dr. Lindsay, do you want to add anything about the science program? Because <laughs> that was mentioned. So I was just making a list here of some of the subjects we cover in our sustainability science classes. And they range from global issues like sea level rise and ocean acidification and micro and nanoplastics in the ocean, right down to, you know, to local problems, like how these, like those exact issues relate into like the Hudson River estuary. So in many of our classes, we try to we talk about these problems on a scalable way. We talk about you know, global sea level rise, for example, and we'll talk about how that will translate into you know, the U.S. East Coast, which you might not be aware of, but there's some hot spots of sea level rise in the East Coast down around Virginia, Delaware, New Jersey. And as you go farther north and south, the problems aren't quite as going to be so severe, but there, and there's some complicated tectonic reasons for that. But, so we talk about these issues and these complicated, these, because they're both global issues and they're local at the same time. Um, and then I think we cover um, most of the major issues, but again, we're, we're trying to talk about solutions, we're trying to talk about what the issues are, but then what are the solutions and something we also focus on and as a faculty are what I call gray zone issues, like what we don't know because there's, we try to get students up to the point where we know this and this and this, but we get to the point where we really don't understand this problem, and these are some of the complicated issues. So and oftentimes, there's a lot of gray zone with a lot of these issues, so um, we try to take students you know, down that path and realize that it's not as always that straightforward. Great. Ming Feng, do you want to add anything? Yeah, yeah. yeah I was going to just say, I think it's a great, great question. Uh, obviously, we, this is absolutely a global issue. And um, climate science, particularly, you know, we, we uh, researchers work on uh, all of the, you know, research problems all over the world. One, one of my students currently working on the Pakistan flood, 
this year, um, this, which is you know devastating um, flood situation there. And we try to understand the science of it. We also uh, try to uh, think of ways to inform the public, you know, the local government about what they can do about it. So uh, that is, you know, it's it's obviously it is not bonded by political system. These are science guided um, uh, advice, uh, advice or recommendations. Uh, but I also want to bring uh, the topic of you know global cooperation. Uh, cooperation. I think you know climate science is probably one of the uh, the science that one of the areas that uh, global cooperation is cooperation is already very productive. Uh, in the sense, we have the IPCC that's issued uh, once every uh, few years, and uh, that summarizes global uh, uh, hotspots of climate change. Uh, impact and uh, that's uh, being distributed everywhere. You know, any, anyone can access that information and try to, uh, you know, incorporate into their policy local, local, local in the local region. And then there's the COP. You know, as some of our students are always involved in uh, trying to attend COP, um, so that those kind of negotiation, international negotiation discussion, I think is uh, super important for uh, solving this justice issue. Uh, in terms of how we can deal with this problem, it can inherently uh, an injustice uh, involved because developing co developing countries are catching up, and developed countries are uh, already kind of uh, uh, contributed a lot to that crisis. So, how do we deal with that situation? And those, I think, are uh, definitely part of the education, as uh, Dr. Cohn said. You know, our students will be the one. Uh, we hope you will be <laughs> solving that problem uh, and, and at least making, making things better. And we think it is getting, getting a lot better already. Yeah. Great. Do you want to add something? Um, oh, sure. Just yeah. very quickly on that, um, you know, the MPA ESP program being housed at SIPA, the School of International and Public Affairs, certainly has a very international student body, international faculty, and in the classroom you certainly cover a lot of those topics. New York is um, in a very international city. Having the United Nations um, right on the east side is very advantageous. Um, this year, Columbia was a co-partner, actually, of Climate Week. Mm -hmm. yes. um, so for those convenings, there were events both on campus and throughout the city um, centered on those topics where, um, you know, uh, you saw everything from loss and damage protesters highlighting the issues of nation of you know SID small island developing states and those in the Pacific those in the Caribbean where my family's from so um, you know certainly have an eye towards uh, that justice lens and equity lens but I'd say um, the difference between when I was a student I think I maybe took one course on environmental justice that was at the law school that was largely focused on the US definition of it and examples locally here in West Harlem up in the Bronx and down on the Gulf Coast. Um, and then seeing now that there's um, way more courses available both on climate and health, um, you know, aspects of environmental justice as it relates to sustainability and in that, into that whole climate justice nexus um, that I've had to get up to speed. And it certainly informs my work outside of the classroom where unfortunately sometimes um, certain groups will uh, express their concerns about the activities of the private sector as it relates to those topics. But I will say that Columbia is still um, a big center of my universe. So anytime there's a talk, I think what, two weeks ago, there was a global energy summit that brought um, professionals from both the public and private sector that were grappling with issues that, you know, I, I thought about as a student, you know, worked on in some respects, but it was, there's something special about being in Learner Hall and, um, you know, seeing, uh, you know, the international elites, uh, you know, tackling the same sort of issues. So for that original question in the back, I'd say, um, you know, there's certainly um, uh, a range of experts that come to campus that um, can heighten the, uh, this, both the student experience and the um, faculty experience, as well as um, adjuncts like myself. Great. So um, one more question. Okay, great. Sorry, I thought we were going to be able to get through more. Um, can we have one more question and make it brief? Um, I saw your hand first. Yes. Oh, sorry. Right there. Yeah. Hello. Hi. Uh, I'm a 2021 alum from SIPA, so I very much echo the sentiments about the Columbia spirit and how the climate school kind of draws you in with their research over time. Uh, so very much relate to that. Um, I've also had opportunities to work over since I kind of came on board the Columbia network to work on a few climate problems. Uh, specifically, uh, I wanted to find out more about, uh, I've kind of worked on piecemeal problems in say carbon stock estimation, heat waves and droughts and subseasonal rates, uh, 
climate forecasting. So it's leading me towards thinking whether I need to step up and kind of be involved in an interdisciplinary program or a doctoral program as a next step. So specifically, would you have any advice for someone who's had some experience but is kind of trying to step it up further, especially on methods uh, or where to get more information about uh, doctoral programs? Well, we do have a, a number of doctoral programs at Columbia, as you know. There's one in sustainable development. Uh, there's also environmental science, uh, the Department of Environment, Earth and Environmental Science is one in the ecology and environmental biology. I think, uh, I mean, it's a funny heretical thing to say, but uh, I think formal education uh, at a certain point, uh, time to, uh, I think formal education uh, is not the only way to learn. And my suggestion is since you already have a, a SEPA master's, put it to work for a while. And when you get to the real edge of your knowledge base, then think about a doctoral program. But you're probably not quite there yet after the last year since you graduated. Yeah, I, I just want to add uh, that in the Climate Society program, uh, quite a lot of this, I mean, not quite a lot, I mean, uh, uh, maybe a little bit like 20 to 30 percent of the students do decide eventually go on to get a PhD. Um, so. Uh, the program it itself is flexible enough, so the students come in and design their own, you know, they have the core, set of core courses, and then they are, they are electives. So uh, if students come in who are very interested in pursuing one specific area, they can take more h higher level, you know, like PhD level courses, I, more in the climate science. So, uh, you know, there's the DEES program, the Department of Earth and Environmental Science PhD program, and uh, uh, they offer a lot of the uh, courses for PhD students at different levels. So some of our students uh, become, you know, come into the program and learn the basics about climate science and feel like, oh, that's really something I want to go deeper. So they would take some of the PhD courses to, in preparation for applying to the PhD program. So that is definitely a possibility. All right, so I think this ends our panel and I'd like to um, ask everyone to help me thank our wonderful panelists for their participation. I do encourage everyone to attend the breakout sessions for each of the programs, and our entire team is happy to answer any questions throughout the rest of today. So thank you so much, and thank you to our panelists.